I'd like to thank Mark for inviting me to be part of this session to tell you about our work with this cute little yellow fruit, which is goldenberry, and we're also working with ground cherry. These are some points I'll cover during my presentation. I'll tell you about how we got started working with the physicalists. I'll then move on to talk about the characteristics that need improvement, and these are being driven by priorities for our NSF project and also feedback from our community scientists. I'll tell you about how we're fast-tracking improvement using CRISPR-Cas, and I'll talk a little bit about our community science project where we're engaging with farmers, home gardeners, and various organizations to get their feedback on the characteristics that they feel need improvement, but to also familiarize them with ground cherry and goldenberry. So how did we get started working with the Fistulus? Well, several years ago, my collaborators, Zach Lippman and Mike Schatz and I had a project where we were looking at genes and networks involved in plant growth habit, fruit characteristics, and inflorescence architecture. We were using a reverse genetics approach through CRISPR-Cas editing. And through this work, we came to realize that CRISPR-Cas could be a powerful tool for fast-tracking improvement of underutilized species, in a sense, fast-tracking domestication of underutilized species. So in our next round of funding, one of the aims was to put that into practice. We chose to stay within the Solanaceae, as you'll see here, some of them, and we wanted to work with the Fissilus because there was very little, if any, improvement that has been done. And the Fissilus you might be most familiar with is Tomatillo, However, we chose to work with ground cherry and goldenberry because in addition to answering our basic fundamental research questions, we felt there was potential for ground cherry and goldenberry to be specialty fruit crops in the U.S. Sometimes you'll see ground cherry in the farmer's market. Occasionally you'll see goldenberry in the grocery stores. And people often ask me what they taste like. Um, ground cherry has a simple sweet flavor, whereas goldenberry has a more complex flavor. It's sweet, tart, and some of our accessions have undertones of coconut, apricot, and mango. Some characteristics of interest to us, it was that they're underutilized. They're more popular in other countries. Colombia is the major producer of goldenberry. It's uh, second, it's, Exports are second to banana from that country. And this image here is a photo I took at a local grocery store, and you can see the golden berries were in with other berries. They have a good nutritional content, vitamin C, beta carotene. They also have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, which lend themselves well to medicinal applications as they have been used for centuries. But not only ground cherry and goldenberry, other physicalists have been used as well. They also have compounds for plant protection, which are with analytes and physalins, which have steroidal properties. Now I'll move on to talk about characteristics that need improvement. Um, we have a list of characteristics that we, we'd like to target. In the interest of time, I'll only be able to talk about plant growth habit and the ground cherry fruit size. Um, most recently, we've been working with these insects, uh, Chloridia subflexa and three-lined potato beetle, because they seem to be major pests, especially on goldenberry. As for plant growth habit, these, this is an image from our field. These image, this photo was taken in July. Um, you can see how tall the plants are. These stakes are six feet from the top of the ground to the top of the stake. And you can see already in July how tall they are. By the end of the season, they grow over the stakes. We ended up having to trellis them. If you can see this twine here, and we um, use something called the Florida weave. But you can imagine on a larger agricultural scale, this would be labor intensive each year. As for ground cherry, there's ground cherries here in the foreground. They, um, the golden berries are in the background. So ground cherries don't grow as tall as golden berries, but they're a very sprawling growth habit. And again, could you know be a problem for farmers um, growing these. And there's also a problem with fruit drop. Um, so the, the fruit drop with underneath the plant, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but um, our major um, target for us is the plant growth habit. The next characteristics I'll talk about is uh, ground cherry fruit size. We learned through a consumer panel um, evaluation that we did in cooperation with Cornell that um, the participants thought that ground cherry fruit size could be, would be, could be bigger. Um, and they thought that the size of the golden berry would be a good size for ground cherry. So you can see the different accessions we have here, the ground cherry size compared to some of our, our golden berries. So how are we using gene editing to fast track this improvement? 
Well, before we could even start with gene editing, we had to work out a plant regeneration system and then a plant transformation method. We looked in the literature to see if anything had been reported for ground cherry, and it hadn't. We found reports for um, tomatillo and for another physalis, but those methods didn't work. We chose to start with ground cherry because it's a diploid, whereas goldenberry is a tetraploid. And we felt that for the editing work, it would be much easier to show that we were successful with editing in a diploid than a, than a, a, a tetraploid at this point. So we um, decided that since there weren't any methods that were reported and the methods we tried didn't work, we would just try our tomato method. So what we do is uh, with the ground cherries, we germinate the seeds on this medium. It contains sucrose, a gelling agent, and also salts to support plant growth. After seven to eight days, you can see how tall, how big those um, seedlings are. We tried the um, cotyledons and also the hypocotyl sections. The cotyledons didn't regenerate, but the hypocotyls, as you can see, regenerated really well. And this medium contains zeatin as the plant growth regulator. After about one month, we can get rooted plants from this stage and they root readily. There's no plant growth regulators that are needed. We then take cuttings and move those cuttings to test tubes. And it's at this stage that we'll take tissue and evaluate those for the edits. Once we have plants that we want to move forward to the greenhouse, we transfer those to soil. We use these plastic water bottles. You could also use plastic bags. We cut off the bottoms. We like these because they're reusable. And if we didn't do this, um, the plants would wilt and die. And that's because when they're in the test tubes, it's a really humid environment and the cuticle hasn't developed. The stomates are wide open. And um, you know, again, these would just wilt and die if we, if we moved them right into soil without covering them. After a few days, we remove the caps. And after a few days more, we remove the bottles. And you can see um, how big the plants eventually get. And then we move these to the greenhouse where they get even larger. And we have a 100% success rate with transferring our plants to soil. Once we had the regeneration and transfer to soil working, we then moved on to look at transformation. And this is work done by Carrie Swartwood. We took those hypocotyl sections and we infected them with the agrobacterium strain, AGL1. Our constructs all have the selectable marker gene in PT2, which confers resistance to canamycin. So we put canamycin in the medium to select for plants that only contain our, our vector or construct of interest. And then again, we move those to soil. For working out the method, we used a green fluorescent protein construct. I really like um, GFP for working out new systems because unlike GUS, it's not destructive. And we can go back um, to the different stages of GFP and just follow that progress through. And if it doesn't look like we're seeing GFP at one stage, we then tweak that stage to get um, more GFP expression. We take that construct, we electroporate it into agrobacterium, and then we do the transformation experiment. This shows some colonies in a plate of the agrobacterium following electroporation. Those colonies, a couple of colonies, are then placed into this liquid um, bacterial medium. They're grown overnight. And then we read the um, OD to make sure that it's at the concentration that we need for doing the infection. So we infect the hypocotyls, and then we look for GFP uh, different days post-infection. This stage is about almost two weeks after infection, and you can see we're seeing green fluorescent protein. If we didn't see expression at this point, we would go back to the agrobacterium phase and start tweaking it by increasing the concentration of agrobacterium and other parameters. That, those little regions there then grew into this green fluorescent callus. We saw shoots. This is under um, white light, bright field, and then this is under fluorescence, and you can see those little green shoots there. We transferred the plants to soil. We still saw the GFP expression. When they were making fruit, I said to Carrie, you know, go out to the greenhouse and let's, let's see if they get some fruit and let's see if they're expressing GFP. And sure enough, they were. We also saw GFP expression in the husks and also in the seeds. And you can see expression here in the embryos, which was an indication that this would persist till the next generation. Once we had the method working efficiently, we then moved on to do gene editing. And as you can see here, we have that NPT2 uh, to confer canamycin resistance. The Cas9 protein, which does the um, cutting of the DNA, is driven by the 35S promoter. And then we have our guide RNAs, which are driven by the Arabidopsis U6 promoter. 
you really only need two guy RNAs to um, get edits, but we really wanted to knock out expression. So we placed our guide RNAs 50 to 100 base pairs apart. But what we have found over time is that sometimes one guide RNA works and the other one doesn't, even though we've followed all the guidelines. So we, we save ourselves time by including two, sometimes we do four guide RNAs. Um, and then if one or two don't cut, we still get edits um, from other guide RNAs. For the targeted traits of interest, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on just the plant growth habit and the um, fruit size and the interest of time. So for plant growth habit, there are a number of genes we could target, uh, but we'd start it with this self-pruning gene. And before I start talking about self-pruning, I need to tell you a bit about uh, sympodial growth. So in tomatoes, you know, there if you grow them, there are these tall continuing to grow indeterminate types, and then there are also more compact determinate types. Well, those indeterminate types have this sympodial growth that what happens is, is you get these sympodial units where you have three leaves, fruit, three leaves, fruit, and that will continue. And that's because of this gene called self-pruning, which encodes an anti-florogen or an anti-flowering um, hormone. But in the 1920s, a grower saw more compact plants in his field. And over the years when those were characterized, they determined that they were mutants in this SP gene. And the hallmarks of SP mutants is a determinant growth habit, burst of early flowering, and these shortened sympodial units. And, and using this material for breeding really revolutionized commercial tomato production. So we wanted to recreate those uh, SP mutants in our um, ground cherry. And we um, found the, the SP counterpart in ground cherry. And you can see here in red, these, this is the sequence of our guide RNAs. I'm just showing a few of our lines in the edits. You can see here, this one has a deletion. This one has an insertion. And in this guide RNA, you can also see there's some insertions and deletions. So what we saw was very exciting. This is our wild type plant here on the far left. These stakes are about four feet tall. And you can definitely see a difference in the plant growth habit of two of our CRISPR lines. We had others as well. As with all of our editing work, we then collect seed. We look at the next generation to see if the edits persist. And then we put those out in the field and we continue to evaluate them for other characteristics as well. As for fruit size, uh, again, there are a number of genes we could target. We, we chose to start with Clovata 1. And Clovata 1 works in concert with another gene called Wuschel to keep um, shoot meristem maintenance normal. You could imagine that loss of function would increase that meristem size and also increase flow organ number. Well, in our edited lines, the first sign that this was working was in the number of petals. So in the wild type, you can see there are five petals, whereas in our edited lines, there are more petals, seven petals. We also saw an increase in fruit size. This is wild type here. These are um, fruit from our edited lines. And we actually saw a 24% increase in fruit weight. Now, as I mentioned before, using two guide RNAs is helpful because in this guide RNA, we didn't see any edits. But in this one here, we did see edits, although you can't see those edits because of my image. Um, I'll try to move that later and just, you can see it. But again, it was enough for us to see edits. And as with our other material, we're putting these to the next generation and making sure that it persists and we haven't negatively affected any other characteristics. I'm then going to move on just to tell you a little bit about our Fissilis Improvement Project. The purpose of this is to engage with farmers, home gardeners, and, and various um, organizations for using this information to guide our crop improvement, but we also want to heighten the visibility of ground cherry and goldenberry for uh, specialty fruit crops. We have a website if you're interested in um, following along. Just search for Fissilis Improvement Project. You can subscribe to our blog. I have a, a Twitter account, and we also have an account for the Fissilis Project, and we're using this as a platform to also communicate about crop improvement methods, including gene editing and genetic engineering. So in summary, um, CRISPR-Cas is a powerful tool, but do we, we need it all the time? No, I, I think I can get concerned when um, especially the younger generation gets enamored with new technology. Uh, we don't always need CRISPR, but it certainly can help um, in, in plant breeding. Our first modifications that we did, this SP and Clovada 1, took just two years, 
and uh, that included developing the transformation method. So our end goal is to create variation for the traits of interest to have enhanced germplasm that can be used in breeding programs. We're now moving on to goldenberry, and for ground cherry and goldenberry, we have these new directions. One of those I mentioned is looking at insect interactions, and we're going to uh, we started looking at metabolites that could be possibly involved um, with those interactions. For, on, with that, I'd like to thank the members of my group. I'd also like to thank our um, greenhouse group, Brian, Joe, and Jay, for growing beautiful plants for us. Uh, my collaborators, Zach Lippman, Mike Schatz, our community science participants, our funding agencies, because without them, we wouldn't be able to do the work. And I'd like to thank you for attending my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions now.